regarding midterms today after this lecture, uh, I will release the, the midterm exam. So you have the week, unless you're CCD's white team, in which case you have two. Uh, let's see, any questions on the mechanics of the thing? Mechanics of the midterm? Yeah. I know checks, right? I, I ask you questions. <laughs> I mean, hey, Cal. Bitcoin, man. Bitcoin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Untraceable, hello. Well, well except untraceable. Untraceable as well. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I have officially started looking at the uh, the rough drafts, and that I've looked at one. So, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I I will try and get you some feedback on that. Yeah, midterms. It's a lot work. It's a lot of work for faculty before and after the midterm. The midterm itself is this blissful week of like no problem. It's the same same deal with projects. That it's like you know it's prepping the projects and helping people, and then like okay, project presentations this week, party time. <laughs> Uh, so we don't, uh, so, so yeah, totally different perspective. So we, we've been working our way through the math elliptic curves. I, this is hopefully the last day of talking about the math elliptic curves. Uh, so we have some arithmetic to do to do an elliptic curve point intersection. This is all in a finite field, which means that this multiply is just a multiply followed by a mod operation. The subtract is just a subtract followed by a mod operation. And the big problem is the divide, because the divide is not a divide followed by a mod operation, because you get zero half the time, right? If I do an integer divide, then most of the stuff in the field is like all the same magnitude, so you're going to get zero or one, which you've just lost a ton of data. Uh, so, so finite field division is really funky. It's the extended Euclidean algorithm, and it turns out to be like really crazy slow. Like if there's like a hundred, a hundred multiplies in there to do the, or hundred modular operations in doing the extended Euclidean algorithm, which is it's slower than anything, right? You could, you could do tons of additional arithmetic, and it would still be cheaper to do the uh, the elliptic curve point multiplication. And and performance actually matters, right? This is not just like oh, let's save some nanoseconds. I mean, the big problem is here. If I do like a, this is our little elliptic curve to Hellman, and we do show right. If I just uh, basically take some random bits, walk down the curve that far. There's my public key. I send that even my public uh, key. I send that out. Uh, I multiply the other guy's public key by my secret, and they're doing the same thing uh, with mine, and uh, then we end up at the same place. But the problem is, this is way, way too slow. So if you run it, I mean, it takes like uh, that particular one point one two seconds. So that's eight per second that I can do. And uh, I mean, if you're running a server, that's bad, right? <laughs> Uh, and and, uh, and and it's bad in a couple of ways, right? There, there's this there's this huge opportunity for denial of service, and if you if you set up your elliptic curve to be in the wrong way, it's very easy. I mean, you, you could make a very denial of service friendly uh, uh, architecture. So so for example, if you're a server, and this and the protocol is somebody connects to you and says like, I would like to do this elliptic curve stuff, and then you the server have to basically do this really expensive operation of like uh, generate some random numbers, and I'm hoping they're doing the same thing, right? I'm multiplying on the curve, which is this really compute intensive operation. I send them the curve, right, this public secret. And by that point, they don't care. They've hung up. And in fact, they've just spammed me with a thousand new requests saying, like, oh, we totally should do this whole key exchange. So, so if you wanted, so if, if, if there's some asymmetry here, and one of these is a client, one of these is a server, how do you structure the communication? What's the right way to do this? So client usually initiates this stuff, right? The client says like, "Hello, web server. What do you what What do you send next?" Are you, you, you have to create a curve at some point. Yeah. Usually the curve is like an enum, like you know, there's like you know one byte or something saying like, "We're using curve three. Okay, awesome, right? Everybody's agreed that that's you know, SEC two fifty six or something. Uh, so, yeah, so you have to communicate the curve somehow. I mean, the curve has to be agreed on beforehand. Generating the curve would be a lot of work. Uh, so, so you don't do that, right? Hard-coded curve, that saves you an enormous amount of effort right there. Uh, and then there's some weak curves, and it's tough to tell which ones are weak, so you just pick, pick a curve and stick with it. So that's, uh, the, there's progress. Well, who, who sends what? Do we do this at the same time? So I'm claiming this is a bad idea, because there's no way for the server to verify the client is actually doing this work of, like, walking down the curve. If so... 
Yeah. So you wait for them to send their, yeah. their public. So, so step one, right? So, so this is the sort of asymmetric uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman. You connect to me and you say, like, oh, let's do Diffie-Hellman on curve three. And it's like, great, where's your point? Right? So, so they, they send you a point, And what do you do? Right? You just say, well, I assume that's a good point, zero, zero. Right? Uh, it might be an invalid point. So you check to see, hey, is this on the curve? Have I ever seen this point before? Is it the generator? Right? Uh, it's really expensive to just to generate random points on a or like. Uh, uh, I can't just like make up a random x coordinate, y coordinate. It's not going to be on the curve. If I give you an x coordinate, it's actually a fairly expensive operation to find the y coordinate. So I mean, it, it might be the, the the best way to generate a random point on a curve is just to do this, right? Walk down the curve that far. So so yeah, so, so you can you can structure this sort of exchange. So basically, client has to sh send this proof of work saying like I have come up with a random curve point. I've done at least some amount of effort to do that. Uh, and then and then the server might go through the work of saying, okay, I'll make I'll crank through an a, a, a ephemeral work for you. But even if you're not explaining like uh, the client isn't trying to denial of service you. Like I, I've got a robot uh, upstairs where basically the communication protocol it literally does a connection to the server. It says, does anyone want to drive in any direction? And if the answer is usually no. And then it just hangs up, right? Connect, you want to drive? No. Nope. Connect, you want to drive? No. It's arguably a fairly stupid implementation. The, the nice part is that, like, server can crash, robot can crash, network can come up and down, and, like, we're always ready to go, right? It'll just, as soon as the network is available and both sides are up, it'll start, you know, establishing connections and knowing that, it, uh, that no one wants to drive it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the deal is, uh, so, so to get good latency, right, like, you want, I don't know, maybe a tenth of a second tops? Ideally, like a thirtieth of a second, which means that the client has to has to basically just be spamming, saying, "Anyone on a drive?" And you could imagine if I load a normal web page. I mean, I guess my my web pages are a bad example because I this is like HTML 1.0 or something. There's one file. It's called HTML, and there's no style sheets. There's no uh, image files. There's no menu bar. There's no JavaScript. There's no nothing. But most web pages, like if you load Facebook, there's like a hundred page elements or something, right? There's all the little, you know. All the graphical geek guys all over the place. There's like uh, you you, you got to load. Uh, uh, what's what's the one everybody uses? jQuery. jQuery 15 times, yeah, <laughs> and and you know in six different versions. So yeah, you so you do uh, so it's all all that stuff. Separate files, separate accesses. So the deal is like one client loading a web page might be effectively denial of service if it takes a long time to do this stuff. So we want to speed this up. Divisions are a limiting factor. <sighs> what do we do? Yeah. So, so, so the cool part is, uh, have you seen fixed point? Is that a thing? Yeah. How people have seen fixed point? I see two, three. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, uh, so, so again, the, the problem might be like if I'm if I'm a bank and I'm computing your bank account number is thirty seven dollars and sixty two cents, then uh, the point sixty two you, you can start as a float. But then you usually end up having like thirty-two dollars and sixty-one point nine 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 seven cents, or something, which is kind of a pain. So you can represent decimal values as integers by just say storing it in cents. So I'm going to have thirty-seven sixty-two, and uh, it turns out you can so essentially I've just shifted the decimal point. Do all the calculations in cents. The only time this doesn't work is if I do multiplication. So if I'm trying to calculate the interest rate or something is uh, one point oh two, so that's a two percent interest rate. Well, 1.02, okay, it's 102 cents, right? 102 times 36, okay, so now we get 37.62 combined with, oh gosh, twice this, uh, 4, 2, 1, I don't know why I picked this number, uh, 7, oh, good golly. Uh, right, so 4, 2, 7, geez, 3, carry a 1, 8, uh, okay, right. Did that? Did that arithmetic? That was awesome. Uh, you suddenly have three thousand eight hundred and thirty-seven dollars in your bank account. Sounds a lot better. Mm -hmm. Something went wrong here, right? The implicit decimal point actually shifts because now we had we started with cents, we had the percent, and then we have to like take into account the fact that we so, so if I multiply two fixed point numbers, I end up multiplying the scale factors. To this being a problem. So if I get to, so if, if I if I happen to be storing, for example, uh, x times a and y times b, if I multiply them, I get x, y, a, b. If these are my scale factors, I've just doubled my scale factor, squared the scale factor. So 
as long as you keep track of that, you can actually do one division at the end, right? So, so, so the deal is we're going to be doing this. This point multiplication means like you know adding and moving along the curve repeatedly, and we're going to be accumulating some giant value. Nice part is everything's in a field. So we, we actually, numbers are not really getting bigger and bigger, right? This thing all mod some value, right? And then the trick is that we just have to keep track of the scale factor so we can divide it out at the end. So there's a standard way to do this. It turns out you don't need a separate scale factor for x and y. They've, uh, they've, so here's where I, I have, I, I can follow like 80% of the derivation here, so, and I, which is good because like half an hour ago I only followed like 20% of it. Uh, some someday I will I will get this whole thing. Uh, so we, we, what we're storing is instead of instead of the normal x, so I'm going to do this like lowercase x is big X over z, right? So this is going to be so we're going to compute two big integers. This is like the scale factor, right? So so what we're storing the uh, so, so this is the little x on the on the uh, on the curve. This is what we're dealing with before, but we're going to be doing integer versions of this thing. And it, it turns out if I use the scale, same scale factor for x and y, it doesn't work. Right? The, I end up needing different scale factors for x and y, which is annoying. But if I do, uh, let's see, do this correctly, uh, z cubed and z squared. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, my scale factor on x is z squared, and my scale factor on y is z cubed. This turns out to work out, which is cool. So the obvious question is, OK, let's do this. Except now x and y are going to be uh, uh, in, in these ratios. So what, what I got is I, I basically had, so for example, for my slope calculation, I had y1 minus 2. Well, uh, that, that, was, that was his prime version. Now this is essentially having the z1 cubed and the z2 cubed. Uh, let's see. And then I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. So this is m. This is our big m. Wait, are these not the same? Uh, so, 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 so z for a different point is going to be a different scale factor, okay. which <laughs> makes your life harder. Yeah. Uh, yeah so, so I, I've, I've got a different scale factor for each point, and I'm actually going to be calculating some new point z3. It's going to have its own scale factor. So, uh, yeah. So I get uh, I get m, and, and then it's the same deal. So I get x1 over z1 squared minus uh, x2 over z2. Where it kind of looks like we've just replaced one divide with like five divides. <laughs> that's not that's not making any progress. So so now, what do you do? Where where do we go? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> so <clears throat> I I want to get rid of these denominators. I had to get rid of the denominators. We're doing all this. this is like a good review for a you know Cross elementary school. All right, yeah. So, so what I'm going to do is I, I want to get rid of z1 squared, so I'm going to multiply everything by z1 squared. That's going to take care of that. I want to get rid of z2 squared, so i got to multiply both sides. So I'm, I'm going to multiply the bottom by uh, z1 squared, z2 squared. z2 squared. How do I get rid of these up top? So these are z1 cubed and z2 cubed. i got to just multiply by And this is, this is actually good because most of these cancel out. z2 cubed. Uh, and I'm left with a spare factor of, so if, if I multiply by this ratio, then uh, I actually have an extra factor on my m here, right? The extra factor is z1, z2, z1, z2, and m. So that, uh, yes, good. Uh, still, still with. <clears throat> so if, if, you, if you turn the crank here, you end up having, so I get what, uh, y1, z2 cubed. Minus y2, z1 cubed, and let's divide it by x1, z2 squared minus x2, z1 squared. Okay, good. Uh, and, and this is equal to, you know, that, that thing. Uh, so what this is saying, essentially, so, so the, the standard, uh, standard trick, they call this, uh, so... These are just constants. We know what these things are, so we can just give them nice, handy names. So we're going to call, call them D and B. Uh, and, and this is all, so, so basically, D over B equals uh, M, Z1, Z2. Okay, good. Uh, so essentially what we just said is that M is D over B. Uh, so 
C1, C2. This, this, so, so this sort of looks like some progress. There were no divides in here. Right, I can calculate the, the D and B, just calculate them straight away. Uh, let me show you the calculation. So uh, there's D, there's B. Right, so you can just cal calculate them, no, no problem. Uh, it's basically Z, so here's powers of Z1, here's powers of Z2. I kind of like this notation for it. So I've got the powers of each one, and then and I can even do my so so I had to look to see if like uh, is the denominator zero? Well, you know what? If uh, if b is zero, then the denominator is zero, and I have to, I have to look at the numerator zero. If that's the case. So then if numerator is zero, then I, I have so I can do the same special case stuff, and then you know I have to double or whatever return the identity or do you know do do whatever whatever do there. And then there's kind of some uh, some algebraic smoke. The the, uh, the thing that actually so to this I really like. Final Z3. In other words, what is the scale factor on my final output point? It is exactly this. Right? So, so this is M, is the ratio of D and, uh, and, and this. We don't want to actually do the division. right? So D over B, Z1, Z2 is not something we calculate. We just keep track of the fact that, okay, yeah, D is on top and B, Z1, Z2 is on bottom. And where do we stuff all the crap on the bottom at the end? Well, we just stuff it into the output Z. Right? So you can H is calculated. Uh, H is Z1, Z2. So, so the scale factor on M has come out of Z3. And then all we got to do, so, so again, we're, we're, just, uh, we're just following this thing, right? So basically, I mean, I, I, know, I know what X is, right? X is M squared. I know what M is. Here we are. Right? Uh, hey, uh, if I divide by, uh, so, so I'm going to have, uh, so M is really something over the Z, right? Uh, and, uh, and I'll be dying. It, it, X is something over Z squared. So this works out just exactly, this is why it works out. In fact, we have another power of M there, which means that uh, Y is going to end up with something over Z cubed. Hey, that's why this actually works out. And then uh, the thing we've been kind of ignoring is that, uh, so we, we have all these other terms, right? So i got to calculate V. i got to plug V in here to get Y. I get a plug, so I get x1 and x2. These need to be scaled to match that. So basically, I multiply by the bottom, right? And that's essentially what uh, this does. Hand wave, hand wave. <laughs> There's not much code that I, I need to fight my way through it. I think if I had an hour, I could, I could do it. And I should write it up because I can't seem to find anyone that actually writes down the arithmetic for this. There's this is this is one of many different ways to write this down. Uh, but basically, so, so, uh, bottom line, we, we end up calculating an x, and that's basically just m squared minus it's, it's that, right? uh, x1, x2, uh, but with all the appropriate scale factors to get you know, in there, that for zero. Seems to work, so it must be correct. Uh, and, and again, same deal, we're going to calculate y, and we're calculating y the same way, it's just we put the scale factors in to make it, to make it work out. So the bottom line, we have uh, the more, more arithmetic by far. There's more multiplies, there's more subtracts, there's more divides. Uh, so if you benchmark this thing, so again, the, the old code was like 0 0.11, 0 0.12 seconds. And if we look at the, so they call this the Jacobi coordinate representation, right? Dividing by Z cubed, putting the scale factor. We're at like, uh, it's not quite 10 times faster, but it's over five times faster. <laughs> right? So instead of 0.11, it's 0 0.018. I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, and if you're, uh, so that's, I mean, hey, sevenfold faster. That's almost enough that fast enough now that you could just say, yeah, a web server could run that fast. That would be okay. Uh, in fact, the web server only has to do half of that work. Half the work is on the client. And if you got multi, -core, this is per core, right? So you get multi core. You could probably just live with this, right? So I mean, you're talking about. Uh, under a tenth of a second, say under a hundredth of a second per client, right? Half of that work is uh, nine milliseconds or something, and then that's uh, so you know hundredth of a second per client per core. That that ain't bad. An eight core machine, you can satisfy nearly a thousand clients per second. So yeah, okay, it's close enough. Uh, yeah. What if you wanted it to be faster yet? <laughs> I tried. I tried running C++ and it was slower than Python. So, 
my my class. Yeah, it's 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 actually likely. If you, I mean, there there's some beautiful tricks with the where, where you put the mods. Actually, I was kind of surprised to find. I mean, I'm doing a ton of extra mods. I was surprised that if I if I leave out some of these mods, so so because it's it's all a field. I can actually do the mods like at the end we saw last time that I can just I mean as long as my output is finally modded so I can leave off a mod there and then the question is how does that impact the performance it actually slows it down some it randomly generated numbers so the performance is going to bounce around a little bit but uh, th that's a little bit weird you would I mean mod so so I'm adding operations and it's cutting my time down okay. Big, big int, yeah, yeah. That's but, the problem. Oh, uh oh, right. So, so I mean, the deal is like Q1.C is like a 256 bit number. Q1 times Q2 or Q1 squared is like a 512 bit number. So, if I'm dragging around these enormous 512 bit numbers, then it's less efficient than if I do a fairly expensive operation to chop them back down to 256 bits. So, yeah. Uh, okay, questions. And I, I was, uh, I, I, there should be some evolutionary algorithm where you can figure out which of these, are any of these uh, worth removing? That one didn't cut, no, it's, that's still some cost. I should probably have a more accurate timing mechanism. Run one experiment on some random numbers. Uh, well, so, I mean, you could, so you could just explicitly work your way through here. Actually, I bet you this one, that one just gets subtracted. Come on, oh yeah, yeah, see that's a, that's a benefit. Uh, so, so, so the deal is this is subtracting A, and uh, I guess the number is huge anyway. So I could probably get rid of those. So I could, so I could get a little more speed that way. So right, I, I mean, I might be able to eke a few more percent. Oh, man. No, no apparently not. Well, not see, do I use C again somewhere, maybe? Oh, I do use C again. So C, I have to, but A, I don't think I reuse. C, the C term ends up getting, uh, getting used down there. I like the idea of Apple. Oh, but wait, uh, like actually, A gets going. reused there too. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of weird because you can put in mods by P whenever you feel like it. So you're going to get the same answer regardless. So you can you can actually put them in for performance uh, if you want to. Yes, yeah, so some cheaper way to compute mods would definitely uh, make make things more efficient. So I mean, I, I could probably gain a few percent by you know changing that stuff around. I'm, I'm surprised to discover there are there are actually people tabulate all of these different. Uh, so if you look at uh, if you look for these uh, elliptic curve formula, projective coordinates, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's probably automated search. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't know. A lot of these, it's a, like if you look at this one, it's like it's from a paper, right? So 1998, some guys wrote a paper, some people wrote a paper. Uh, but this is a half operation. I don't really know. You could maybe pre-compute the additive inverse of two and then multiply that. But, but that that kind of scared me. Uh, that's why I did not implement that one. But the, 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 there's a bunch of these, so I mean, you can say that these these are all basically 16, you know, uh, 16 cost according to their cost model for for doing point addition. There are optimizations. So for example, if z1 is one and z2 is one, then you can get it down to just four multiplies and two adds, which is super cheap. Uh, how often is that going to happen? Z equals one, z2. I mean, both of these are one. Never, I would guess. <laughs> if you have sort of randomly selected points, yeah, it's never really going to happen. Uh, if I wanted to make the Z's one, is there a way I could make the Z's be one? So, without losing. Yeah, so, so, so recall, uh, I mean, the X on the curve is uh, over Z squared. Z squared. Z squared. Uh, and then the Y on the curve is Y, the, the Y that we scale over. Uh, over z cubed. So if I want to calculate y, in other words, y over 1, I can do it by just doing a division. Right? So you can actually reset the scale factors to 1 anytime you want. I mean, you're doing a division. The division is way more expensive than doing this point operation, so it probably doesn't help that much. Uh, so it, it's kind of surprising they tabulate that, right? Like, I mean, why, why tabulate if it's such a rare occurrence? Or you have to do this expensive operation to get there. Seems funny. So it, it, here's a here's another mystery that maybe will help solve the first. So when I do a multiplication, and this is sort of the key operation here. So I'm going to start at the curve generator. Uh, sorry. 
start at the curve generator and then walk down my secret, right? That's kind of the step one operation for, for any of this stuff. What are the powers of the curve generator? I mean, to, to do this multiplication, I'm going to have to calculate all the powers of the curve generator and combine them. So, uh, this is the way multiplication works. I start with a point. I basically calculate powers of that point, and I'm combining the powers of that point to give me my result. So I have to do a lot of point doubling. If I'm doubling the curve generator, curve generator is like two 256-bit numbers, right? That's the coordinates of the start of the curve. This is going to do the same exact thing every time I run this. It's going to calculate the curve generator times 2, curve generator times 4, times 8. It's going to calculate all the powers of 2 of the curve generator to 256. Do I really need to calculate those? The answer is no. I can pre-calculate all the powers of the curve, so it's a given curve. Maybe I'm going to use that curve again and again and again. The numbers are 256 bits, which is not that tiny, but it's really not that huge, right? It's like uh, it's 32 bytes. So I mean, I, 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 I burn 64 bytes of storage for every power. If I got to calculate a couple hundred of those, that's a few kilobytes, right? So this is a pretty moderate amount of space. Maybe it takes me a, a shotgun or something to less than a second. I guess we, we're calculating them on the fly here. It's a few milliseconds, right? And uh, I can I could actually just hit start up server starts up, can calculate all the powers of the generator. And then you don't have to calculate, uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to do any of this doubling. So bam, that's a, that's, that like doubles your performance at least. In fact, you have to do the point doubling every time through the loop, except the last one. And you only have to do the adds when there's a one. So right, uh, two thirds of the operations are happening right there. So if you can just stick them in a table, then bam, I mean, you're threefold faster already, which, hey, that, that's awesome. And then if, you, so you can further optimize by basically, right, do the division once. You get this, uh, the Z equals one case. And now you can plug this into the cheaper NAT operation, right, because uh, I guess one of the Z's is one, and one of the Z's might not be, so let's see, so. The f first time you do it entirely, I guess, one of, the, one of these is one, so you have a super fast startup uh, the, the first time, and then subsequently you have uh, uh, Z2, Z2 being faster. Does this make any sense at all? So the bottom line, right, keeping track of the scale factors, we can speed up this thing quite, quite a huge amount. Uh, I haven't implemented it. Midterms. You have a midterm, okay. <laughs> Show, yeah. So as soon as we go through and double them, store it all. I, I, I mean, it's it's a it's a tiny amount of storage, really. It's just a matter of keeping track of it. Any downsides to storing it instead of calculating it? Everyone knows the curves; they can all calculate. So, you could pre-calculate it all, yeah. So, like, even if they just yeah. could read memory, that's not a big deal because yeah. side channels. Side yeah. channel. So, say I've just calculated this. So, so and, and this is actually like the the most side channel possible. Uh, thing. I've just calculated all the powers, right? So I have uh, I have you know generator times one times two times four. Da, 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 da. Uh, these things are big, right? They're like sixty four bytes big. For the x and y coordinate, each of which is 26 bits. How uh, does anyone remember from like CS301 or CS441? 64 bytes. What's that the size of? Oh, oh, uh, memory pointer. The cache line. Uh, is it 64 bits is the size of a pointer. Yeah. Oh, 64 bytes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so 64 bytes is the size of one like L0 cache line a lot of architectures. Some, sometimes 128, sometimes 32, but it's somewhere right in that range. Right. So, so assume each one of these, I mean, for, for, for maximum runtime performance, you want this thing aligned to a power of two, which means that's the cache line. So, uh, man, uh, I mean, it, it literally could not get any better for uh, for side channel. Because what happens, right? I'm going to access that one if I have to do this add. When do I have to do this add? If that bit of the secret key is set. This is the secret key. You are accessing these cache lines. I mean, it's like it couldn't get any better for side channel, right? So, so in other words, if, if an attacker on the same physical hardware 
can just basically all they do they're they're allocating memory and they're just timing their access to you know to, to, to the cache lines and if nothing's happening in the machine this is extremely reliable right you get very low error rates and then what they do is a uh, little bit of network traffic happens so you know their code gets switched out it runs your server for a moment your server calculates something or other right comes back they they can see these uh, these cache lines of theirs have been booted right I mean, they, they, that cache line has now been loaded up with your, you know, uh, table of these things, right? So, I mean, uh, so, 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 and, and if I just look at the timing, so Brandon's been working on this, uh, right? You look at the timings for accessing your memory, and you can tell what somebody else using the same cache is accessing, which is quite surprising. <clears throat> How do you defend against this? <laughs> Don't let people on your hardware. Yeah. You know that whole cloud thing? <laughs> it's sort of premised around letting other people on your hardware. You know, your code is running on some box somewhere. I guess you could probably get dedicated or something. So I guess I guess the best you can do is increase the certainty so that you're not necessarily running on the same core. Right? Even on the same Yeah, I mean, chip. So, so, so this is funny, right? Because the I mean the last fifty years of like Timeshare computers has yeah. been premised on like I load up your code and run it for a while, and then I load up my code and run it for a while. And if if me doing stuff is visible to you, that's not okay, right? I mean, you just you can't really get away with it. And, and there's a lot of side channels, right? So 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 you might say, well, the cache we're we're gonna after doing this, we're gonna flush the whole C CPU cache, right? By just you know we'll be reading zeros from some you know dedicated block of zeros to just try and wipe everything. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. yeah, you're vulnerable before or after you do that. Yeah. Uh, I, I've seen implementations where basically they read no matter what, <laughs> and they, they might read it, multiply it by zero, and then add it, right? Which is like <laughs> just some no-op essentially. But they're going to do the same exact memory operation, so we will touch the whole cache, right? But it, it means being fairly careful in how you do the, you know, the, the accesses here. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you, how, what, what? What else? I mean, ways to plug the side channel. I guess you could, hypothetically on the OS, you could say, hey, I'm going to be a secure program. Please let me run with other secure programs on a core by myself. Yeah. Right? Everyone yeah. else can run using any it, You know, it's hardware isolation, right? Yeah. Then it's my core is mine. Well, and and you know, we're not going to let any untrusted programs on, yeah. on that one. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I, I don't know. I mean, you can probably, actually, with EC2, so, so Amazon, right? If you're doing a cloud-based server, if, if you pay, like, you know, very little, then you get a time-shared machine, and you're going to be time-slicing you with all the other stuff. But if you pay more, then you get the dedicated servers to shrub your stuff. So that's good. Uh, yeah, so spend spend more money and get, uh, and, and, I mean, the, the, there have been papers where they have totally reconstructed the whole, you know, Secret key, and and it's crazy because this is uh, the secret key is it's generated once, it's used once, and you still might. You, you, so Joe, uh, I just oh I had to run that run the thing a thousand times. Uh, so to, this is this is really not like the machines like the server secret key. It's regenerated every you know year or two years or something. This is like an ephemeral key used for one session. And they still might be able to grab it, right? They, they get one chance to get these timings right. And so, so, so the deal is like, uh, I mean, maybe you get a timing of like, you know, totally still in cache, no, no question about it. Uh, apparently not in cache, right? I, I mean, it definitely took, took so is it zero nanosecond access, ten nanosecond access, zero nanosecond access. This one was five. And maybe that happens because the pipeline had a hiccup or something. What do you do? In the, I mean, you don't really know if that's a one or a zero. Well, then I just add the yeah, so, so you can check both of them, right? And run it through the curve and see, see what you got. I mean, even if, like, uh, you know, you might have uncertainties about, I don't know, 20 or 30 of these bits, and that's a tiny key space. You can trivially search that. If you get uncertainties about, like, half the bits, that's starting to get pretty painful, <laughs> right? If 200, 100, 128 bits is a big key space to search. But basically, I mean, so, so, so the deal is, uh, you know, you can, you can actually have some errors here. Right, like you might be totally certain about your timings. Like I know somebody blasted that cache line, but you know what? That key doesn't work. <laughs> so you just say, well, maybe that was like a false positive. Like part of the OS is going to load stuff in a cache line. So you may have to kind of exhaustively test, you know, each of these. 
and then you have to exhaustively test combinations of these. But uh, but it's it's totally an achievable tech, right? One time, a single use key can be recovered with a side channel. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. It, like I say, this is probably the ideal situation for side channels. So it, it makes me wonder. You could you just use some bizarro like memory ordering. Like uh, I'm gonna have some really cache unfriendly memory layout. Like you know, one word of data, and then a bunch of uh, you know other stuff interleaved in it, and then another word of data, all in separate cache lines. I mean, cache cache uh, transmission. Questions. Make it something other than 64 bytes? That, that, that would probably be a good idea. If pad those things out to be some non multiple of the cache line. <laughs> or a non multiple of two would be good. It is funny. We always, I mean, I just reflexively pick, like, uh, you know, like, like you can, there's elliptic curves like 221 bits, you know, some weird number. And it just feels like, no, it should be 256 bits. It seems more correct <laughs> somehow. That's probably the worst possible value to use. <laughs> We should probably be using a three, like 384 bit. You know, it's more security than 256 bit, just as far as like you know brute force enumeration and some smarter attacks, and then it's probably more side channel resistant. Yeah. So, so there's there's an enormous number of these. I mean, they have just just goes. There's too many by far. Uh, some of these are actually quite simple, right? Like if you uh, let's see. so if if both of the z's are one, then this is basically did it link to the right spot? So this this should be essentially uh, x2 minus x1. Uh, uh, yeah, m squared minus j minus 2 times v. I don't really get. That's probably a different formulation. Oh, and then oh yeah, and then z comes up. So they're not doing the divide again. So so there is some uh, some a little bit more more output there. Yeah. So uh, let's see. So, you, so tons of ways of adjusting performance here. I, I like the idea of pre-calculating the uh, the table. Actually, virtually all implementations, OpenSSL in particular, it's going to pre-calculate the table of uh, all of these uh, the, the doublings, just because it's it's such a huge performance win than some minor you know uh, side channel leakage is considered acceptable. I, I don't know if it should be, but that's uh, that's that's the way we we roll today. Okay. A any questions about elliptic curves in general? We haven't looked at a bunch of there's there's a million other applications of elliptic curves. Like elliptic curve digital signature elliptic curve digital digital signature algorithm. It's the exact analog of the RSA. There's an RSA style digital digital signature algorithm. I can't pronounce it. Sorry. RSA. Yeah. So it uh, and. and uh, more math. Questions? So we'll, we'll definitely have to do those. So let's see. So, so there is a, uh, there's going to be a midterm available online really quick as soon as I upload it. So I shouldn't, I, I think I'm just going to let you go early to go work on that because there's a lot of work. Is there actually a lot of work? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of relative, a lot for a week. How many questions? Well, I guess there's, there's only like, there's only like, yeah, right? Because there's one of them be like, break this 128. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had last semester with 